One of the most straightforward ways of characterizing stars is to categorize them by brightness. But trying to determine a decent quantifiable scale to measure brightness proved to be quite a difficult task for ancient astronomers to overcome. It all began in 129 BCE with ancient Greek astronomer Hipparchus of Nicaea. He basically created a system of categorizing stars by simply stating the obvious. He called the brightest stars, which were the first to appear in the night sky after sunset, the stars of the first magnitude. The second brightest were those of the second magnitude, third brightest, third magnitude, and so on and so forth. To this day, we talk about the brightness of stars by discussing their magnitudes. The naked eye can see down to the sixth magnitude of brightness for the dimmest stars. But the limiting factor here is the amount of light pollution that may be emanating up towards the night sky from major cities. So only in the countryside or in national parks would we be lucky enough to see stars as dim as the sixth magnitude or dimmer. With a good set of binoculars, we can see down to the tenth magnitude of the dimmest stars. Larger telescopes can help us see stars of even dimmer magnitudes, down to the 14th or 15th magnitude in a good dark night sky, like the one seen here over Bryce Canyon National Park in Utah. Now, all of these magnitudes of brightness are technically what we refer to as the apparent magnitude of a star. The apparent magnitude, designated by the lowercase letter m, is the brightness of a star as it appears, located at its actual distance. It's what we see. There is another type of magnitude that we also commonly use. This is the star's absolute magnitude, represented by the capital letter M, which is the brightness of a star as it would appear if it were located at a standardized distance of 10 parsecs from the Earth. We see the stars in the night sky the way we do because of two things, their brightness and their distance. The distance to the stars won't change much in our lifetimes, so the apparent magnitude is literally the brightness of the star exactly as we see it, exactly where it is. But if we were to move them all, hypothetically of course, to a distance of 10 parsecs, their brightness will inevitably change. We can now see their true brightness in comparison to one another as they are now momentarily side by side. Think of it this way. Imagine a crowd of people at the beach. We know from experience that there are many different types of people at the beach. There are adults, children, and teenagers, all of whom are generally at different heights. But this is easy to tell about the people in the foreground. What about those all the way in the far distance? We won't really know until we bring everyone to the same distance, a standardized distance, from our point of view. Only then will we be able to tell any information about the heights of the people way off in the far background. This is exactly the scenario with the absolute magnitudes of stars. A very bright star might look dim if it's very far away. And a star that's not so bright, but significantly closer, may look brighter than the very bright star in the distance, only because it's closer to us. The apparent magnitude of a star will vary depending on the distance to that star. It follows an inverse square law, which states that the intensity of the light that we see from a distant star is heavily dependent on how distant it actually is. If the star is moved to twice its original distance, and is now considered to be further away, we will only see a fourth of the original intensity of that starlight. Move it to three times further away than its original distance, and the light intensity has dropped by a factor of nine. The further away the star, the less of its light we can see. When light emanates outwards from a radiant object like a star, the light travels in all directions, in all 360 degrees. The further away we are with our telescopes or binoculars looking at that star, the less of its light rays we will see. That's why distance makes such a big difference in the magnitudes of stars. To understand how the scale of apparent magnitudes actually works, and what it means about the brightness of two stars of different magnitudes, we must first start with the basic concept that helps give the apparent magnitude a quantifiable scale. In the case of two stars with a magnitude difference of five, the dimmer star will be 100 times dimmer than the brighter one. So this 1 to 100 brightness ratio can be broken down into five equal increments. Now, you may instinctively think, oh great, each increment should be 20 times brightness ratio, but that's the thing about things being two times or three times bigger or brighter than something else. These comparative values are being amplified from lower to higher levels by being multiplied by some value.
So if each of these increments were multiplied by 20 each time, we would have a scale going from 1 to 20 to 400 to 8,000 to 160,000 to over 3 million. And that's definitely not what the initial concept of the 1 to 100 brightness ratio stated at the beginning. So this ain't it. So what are these increments actually supposed to be? Well, if we multiplied 1 by 2.5 and then 2.5 again for a total of 5 times, we'll have ended up matching the brightness ratio of 1 to 2.5 to 6.25 to just about 16, almost 40, and almost 100. In reality, the more accurate number to multiply by is 2.512, but 2.5 is good enough for us to move forward with the idea that stars of varying magnitudes have specific brightness ratios to one another. In this picture taken here of the stars of the Summer Triangle, seen here over the Great Wall of China, Vega is the brightest with an apparent magnitude of 0.03, making it almost exactly twice as bright as Altair, whose apparent magnitude is 0.77. Remember that if the jump had been a solid one magnitude, say from zero to one, then Vega would have been exactly two and a half times as bright as Altair. With Deneb being the dimmest of these three stars with an apparent magnitude of 1.25, it is actually just about three times dimmer than Vega and almost 1.3 times dimmer than Altair. Here we can see a full scale of the apparent magnitudes of common celestial objects and phenomena. The Sun, being the closest star to us, has an apparent magnitude of negative 26. This makes it almost 13 billion times brighter than Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky. Even a full moon with an apparent magnitude of negative 12 is almost six times as bright as a quarter moon whose apparent magnitude is negative 10. Of all the planets visible in the night sky at certain points in the year, Venus is the brightest, with its apparent magnitude of negative 4. As we move further down the scale, we can see that the North Star, Polaris, is actually quite dim, being only of the second magnitude. Even dimmer than Polaris are stars in the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth magnitudes, and anything dimmer than that requires technology to make them visible to us. So with a pair of good binoculars, we can see down to the ninth magnitude. If we were using a 3-inch or a 6-inch or a 12-inch telescope, we can see down to the 12th or 13th or 14th magnitudes, extremely dim stars. Observing through a 200-inch telescope like the Hale Telescope at Mount Palomar Observatory near San Diego can help us see stars as dim as the 20th magnitude. But allowing the telescope to observe longer exposures over longer periods of time can increase the realm of possibility and bring forth stars of the 24th magnitude. In fact, the dimmest stars we've managed to observe have had an apparent magnitude near positive 30, and this has only been made possible by an 18-hour long exposure taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Let's look at the apparent and absolute magnitudes of some familiar star patterns and constellations. We'll start with the stars that make up the Big Dipper asterism in the constellation Ursa Major. The seven, technically eight, stars that make up the Big Dipper are Dubby, Merak, Fecta, and Megrez, which make up the bowl of the Big Dipper, and the handle consists of the stars Alioth, Mizar, and Alcor, and Alcade. Each of these stars appears to us the way they do because of two things, their distance and their brightness. The apparent magnitudes can be seen here, represented by the size of the circles replacing the stars. The bigger the circle, the brighter the apparent magnitude of that star. When we move all of these stars to a standardized distance of 10 parsecs, their brightness changes, increasing significantly because they've all, coincidentally, moved closer to us. Now, if we revisit the Summer Triangle, but this time focus on an asterism in the constellation Vulpecula, we'll see a series of 10 relatively dim stars that can be connected to form the shape of a cotanger thus giving this asterism its very fitting name. These stars have such dim apparent magnitudes, anywhere between the 5th and 7th magnitudes, that it's incredible to think how far away they must all be if their magnitudes change to reflect the increase in brightness we would see if they were all brought closer to a distance of 10 parsecs from the Earth. This table represents the apparent and absolute magnitude values used to create the previous animation. In our last example, we see a familiar winter sky scene. Procyon in Canis Minor shines brightly near Sirius in Canis Major. 
both of which are the loyal canine companions of Orion the Hunter. The apparent magnitudes of these stars can be seen here, the sizes of the circles shown again representing the relative brightness of each star. Now, if these stars were all moved to a standardized distance of 10 parsecs, their absolute magnitudes would also noticeably be different. The next time you catch yourself staring at the stars, chances are you'll be wondering how far each star is actually located and how bright each one truly is.